This video is one of a series I'm posting that show the bouquet characteristics of individual classic film era lenses. I hope it'll be useful for anyone interested in buying or learning more about vintage lenses or seeing the kind of bouquet they produce at different stops, how sharp they are, how they handle out of focus areas and so on. The lens I'm using in the video is a Super Takuma 50 f1.4, the early 8 elements version, made in Japan from 1964. The lens has developed a strong, almost cult-like reputation amongst users of old lenses over the years, as one of the very best bouquet producers wide open. But what is it really like? Does it live up to its reputation? So let's start right away with some test images taken by the lens at each of the main stops, from stop right down at f16, to wide open at f1.4. It's not the most exciting of compositions, but it's designed to show you how the lens progressively blurs the outer focus areas and handles background lights. One of the things to notice with these shots is how fast the blades start to impact lights in the background. The lens only has six blades, and between f1.4 and f2, the bouquet balls soon start to turn into hexagons. Now I think it's fair to say that most people tend to prefer the smoother edge shapes to hexagons, unless you're trying to capture geometric shapes deliberately. So if you're using this lens for smooth bouquet, you really do need to use it wide open. And if it's wide open, then you want the lens to be as sharp as possible on the object in focus, i.e. you don't want to have to stop down to get some sharpness. Not all fast fifties are particularly sharp wide open, but fortunately this lens is definitely sharp enough. To demonstrate this, I've taken a photo of an old zebra lens, first stopped down to f16, focusing on the numbers, you can see how sharp the lens is. And now transitioning to wide open. The in-focus numbers still look good and sharp. I've slightly adjusted the light balance on these images, but not added any sharpness in post-processing. And this sharpness, coupled with a reasonable minimum focal distance of 0.45 meters, makes this an impressive lens to use on modern digital sensors. One of the great strengths of any Fast 50 is how it can take ordinary scenes and turn them into much more eye-catching images by isolating the subject in focus and blurring the background. For example, take this stop-down photo of a camera on a table with a chair and lamp in the background. The camera is a Fex Ultra Himalaya made in France in 1951. If you move the aperture to wide open, the lens performs its magic with the kind of narrow depth of field you'd expect from a 1.4 lens. However, not only is there some serious subject isolation going on here, there's also a lovely, smooth and dreamy rendering of the background blur. And it's the quality of this bouquet where the lens really delivers. It's one of the reasons why the lens has such a strong reputation amongst users. I've tried many different Fast 50s, and this lens really is one of the best performers wide open. Some lenses struggle a bit to smooth out of focus details and highlights, or they mash it all up in a rather distracting way, and the transitions into and out of focus are not very natural. But this lens often renders blurred details very artistically. In this photo of a bollard taken stop down, there's a lot going on in the background. Wide open, the details haven't disappeared, but they've been very sympathetically blurred and rendered, and the colours are good too. And here's another example of how background details are smoothed out. Fences and railings are a good way of testing transitions from into and out of focus. These transitions are quite natural, not the rather crude sliver of in-focus areas you can see with some lenses. So I'd say this is one of those lenses where the bouquet can genuinely be described as having a kind of painterly quality, with a watercolory rendering in the right conditions. One of the reasons why the lens renders in this way is it only has limited coatings compared to later multi-coated lenses. The lack of coatings can result in subtle and sometimes significant light leaks that in effect wash out some of the details in an image, and this can produce a more painterly look. In terms of flares, the lens does flare in extreme situations, but not in an extravagant way like some other Fast 50s. On balance, the lack of coatings do make a difference wide open, and often in a positive way in my opinion. Stop down, while it's fair to say that the later multi-coated lenses do generally have better contrast and flare control. Another important feature of a great bouquet lens is how it handles background lights, either direct light sources or reflective light, to produce bokeh balls or other shapes. This is a Kodak 620 from 1932 with the indoor tree lights in the background. Wide open, the lens produces these gorgeous bouquet balls, 
some of the more beautiful and cleanly rendered shapes of any film era lens I've used. And I've got an example here taken in very bright light that also shows the impact of those six blades. I rather like this effect in this particular composition stop down, even though it's very busy. If you transition the lens to wide open, then you get back to a wonderful collection of beautiful, smooth bouquet balls. Returning to the transitions between stops for a moment, the lens gets progressively sharper as you stop down until around f11 to f16, where there's not a lot of difference, except that the starbursts produced are more dramatic when you fully stop down, like most lenses. So that's a quick analysis of the bouquet characteristics of this lens. For the rest of the video, I'd like to show you some other examples of bouquet transitions and talk a little more about the lens and its reputation. I've owned this lens for many years and found it to be a very good portrait lens and also a competent landscape lens. But in terms of bouquet-rich images, you often need to try a different style of composition. I've already mentioned that taking photos of fences and railings is a good way of testing a lens's into and out of focus transitions. But there are many other ways you can play with this lens's bouquet. Flowers, of course, can make lovely images with very dreamy and painterly images in the right conditions. But really, any composition with something in the foreground, centred or to the side, can work to give a strong sense of subject isolation and pop, combined with smooth background blur. And you can play with foreground blur as well. It doesn't have to be all in the background. Direct or reflected light can help a lot to add interest to blurred areas. You can point this lens very close to the sun wide open with a good hood and it'll cope very well with extremely bright light. The flares tend to intrude more when it's stopped down. I especially enjoy taking photos when the sun comes out after it's been raining. While we scroll through these images, I'd like to say a few words about why the 8 elements version of the Tacoma 50 f1.4 has developed such a cult status among some collectors and experts compared to other lenses. I think there are three main reasons. Firstly, the 8 element Super Tacoma 50 f1.4 was one of the first SLR lenses from Japan that seriously challenged the preeminent position of German lenses. The f1.4 lens, faster than the standard f1.8s, was designed to compete with the best lenses in the market for professional photographers and serious amateur photographers. Combined with Pentax's market-leading SLR cameras with through-the-lens metering, the 1.4 built a strong worldwide reputation as one of the very best Fast 50s. Secondly, the Super Tacoma 50 f1.4s came in two main versions, the early 8-element version followed by a redesigned 7-element lens. And then there were two more 7-element Takuma versions, the Super Multi-Coated version and the SMC version. And these last two versions also had 8 blades rather than 6. If you'd like to learn more about the different versions, I posted a separate video on this subject, and I'll provide a link at the end. The 7-element lenses are excellent lenses as well, and ones that have the more radioactive glass are especially good if you don't mind using radioactive lenses. I should say that my 8-element versions have traces of radioactivity, but not nearly as strong as the later models. I think that the existence of an earlier 8-elements version, a lens that was clearly more complicated and expensive to make, has given it a sort of mythical status, and one that collectors and experts are most likely to mention when they consider the best film era Fast 50s, to the point where some have claimed that the excellent 8 elements version was actually too expensive to produce and had to be replaced with a cheaper 7 elements design. Thirdly, there's the performance of the lens. This is a more subjective area, but I do own the different versions of the Takuma lenses, and my experience is that the 8 elements version produces the most artistic dreamy bouquet, given the relative lack of coatings, and at the same time it tends to be just a little sharper wide open. That's my impression anyway. I'd be interested to hear other people's experiences on this. Stop down, on the other hand, the later versions win on contrast, flare control, and color rendering. For this reason, I'm not at all convinced that the redesigned 7 elements versions represent a sort of cost-cutting reduction in excellence. They are very good lenses in their own right. Returning to the 8 element version, I've learned a lot about how this lens performs stop down and wide open during the making of this video. I've never consistently taken so many photos using different stops, or so many photos of autumn leaves. Comparing it to other film era Fast 50s, I wouldn't say it's an absolutely unique lens, 
there are a number of other great fast 50s around from other manufacturers. And looking at the photos, there are some stellar 55mm lenses, even amongst Takuma lenses. I'm particularly fond of the early auto Takuma 55s, for instance, and tend to prefer the 55s over the 50s as a focal length. Nevertheless, my own conclusion, purely in terms of wide open bouquet, is that the 8 element Takuma lens does justify the hype, and not just for optical reasons. It's certainly one of the more interesting and impressive film era lenses. That's it. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the photos and the way I presented the transitions. I'd welcome any comments or observations you might have about this Takuma lens or any other Fast 50s. And here's a link to my video on the different versions of the lens.